Let's bring in David Brophy. He is a senior lecturer in modern Chinese history at the University of Sydney. Uh, great to have you on the program. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, this was the largest pro-democracy demonstration in the history of China's communist regime. What triggered this uprising in 1989 and how unprecedented was it? The uh, spark for the protest was the death of Hu Yaobang, who was regarded as a, a liberalizing reformer in the party leadership. Uh, he'd recently been marginalized, and there'd been a series of ideological campaigns and restrictions on free speech that uh, students resented. The demands themselves were not entirely new. Uh, attacks on party corruption were a feature of the Cultural Revolution. There'd been democracy activism in the wake of Mao's death. Um, I think what we can say is that Tiananmen was initially an effort to revive a flagging process of top-down liberal uh, political and economic reform, which then over the course of three months evolved into a more wide-ranging confrontation with the party. You know, top Communist Party leaders were very much divided over how to handle the unrest. Uh, there was one faction that wanted peaceful negotiation and another demanding a crackdown. As we know, of course, the latter won. Why was this faction mm. able to push through their harsh crackdown? Well, to an extent, there was a degree of manoeuvring. Um, so the, the relatively moderate Zhao Ziyang was actually away from China when the hardliners took the first step towards suppression. Uh, Gorbachev, Mikhail Gorbachev's visit to Beijing in May was a very embarrassing moment uh, for the party. The, um, the party were all committed to party rule at the end of the day. Um, once enough of them were convinced that concessions would only invite a deeper challenge uh, to the party, uh, then the moderates uh, fell into line behind the repression. The Communist Party of China did everything in its power to wipe out this part of Chinese history. For example, there are uh, no clear numbers on how many people actually died during the Tiananmen Square massacre. I know from having lived in Beijing for a number of years that this is not something that people ever talk about. It's a very sensitive subject. If it's brought up, it's referred to euphemistically as the June the 4th incident. So how is this being remembered or being perceived in China now more than 30 years later? Well, there will be small semi-private -private commemorations held by family members of the victims who are still um, you know, lobbying for some acknowledgement um, of the, uh, the the deaths that occurred you know, during the crackdown. Um, <clears throat> there'll be a certain amount of social media messaging that escapes uh, censorship. Um, as we've just seen, the, uh, the annual rally in Hong Kong has been prohibited. Uh, that's been the one place um, belonging to the People's Republic of China, where some public commemoration has been possible. Um, so clearly, the party's efforts to restrict discussion have contributed to, to neutralizing this topic. But they've also done that by persuading enough people in China of the, the importance of stability. Uh, their message has been that China in 1989 risked descending into, into chaos that would have set back the party's efforts to, to modernize the country uh, and improve living standards. And um, you know, the experience of the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, was uh, was taken as evidence by the party of the, um, uh, the you know, as a vindication of that position. And, and for the time being, I think, I think we have to acknowledge that they have been able to persuade, uh, you know, a significant segment of the Chinese population of that, that viewpoint. All right. And we'll leave it there. David Brophy, thank you so much.